Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Michael Bronstein, who's visiting us from uh, Lugano. Um, and uh, he's done some fantastic work in uh, shape, uh, anything shape, and he's going to talk to us today about manifold correspondence uh, from a signal processing perspective. So take it away. Thank you, Jamie. So thank you for the ni nice introduction. And uh, well, I've been working for quite some time in the field of 3D shape analysis, so today I would like to show uh, some recent results in the, in the, from the last few years, uh, mainly talking about uh, shape correspondence, well, more general, manifold correspondence. And I will explain in, in what sense uh, it, it's from a signal processing perspective. So I guess being here at Microsoft, I don't need to tell you that uh, nowadays we are flooded with uh, uh, 3D geometric data. And this is owed to the availability of uh, 3D sensors. Of course, Microsoft Kinect is probably the most famous and the most well-known example, but there are also many others. And uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, repositories of 3D shapes like Shapeways or Google 3D Warehouse. And today, I think there are probably tens or maybe even hundreds of millions of 3D shapes available in the public domain. And also the, the uh, 3D printing technologies that make uh, basically everybody today can buy a cheap 3D printer. And what is probably more remarkable about all this stuff that these are technologies that are there for the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, basically the, the main technological revolution was making them uh, available uh, for the mass market. And basically the principles have been, uh, have been there for quite some time. I don't know if you followed the Consumer Electronics Show this year, but well, my second affiliation is with Intel and I was uh, involved in the development of what Intel brands as the real sense technology. So probably something like 75% of the Intel CEO presentation was dev uh, devoted to 3D sensing. And basically today, I don't know if you can buy them in the UK, but probably in the US you already can buy. There are several computers, laptops, and all-in-ones and tablets which feature this uh, 3D sensor. And basically you can use your laptop to scan 3D objects and, uh, for example, to recognize your gestures. And this, of course, opens quite a nice uh, set of different applications from the more traditional, like 3D object scanning, reconstruction, recognition, shape retrieval, to more exotic things like 3D avatars. There is a nice Swiss company called FaceShift that does it in real time. Uh, applications like virtual dressing or gesture control, I guess, here. That's the, one of the main expertise and probably one of the, the, the leading labs in the world. Uh, doing gesture uh, tracking and gesture control, the different futuristic interfaces like what you could see in the movie Minority Report 10 years ago. It looks, looked like science fiction. Not anymore, I guess. You can do actually much better than it was shown in the movie. So if you look in a little bit broader perspective at the landscape and basically trying to position these problems uh, with different fields, so we can think of 3D world mm -hmm. where basically we have some three-dimensional geometric models of objects surrounding us. So for example, in the computer graphics field, it would be uh, objects represented as triangular meshes. On the other hand, we have the two-dimensional world of uh, basically how a camera would see uh, these objects. So it's a kind of uh, two-dimensional projection. And also we have some n-dimensional world basically of some feature spaces or representations of these objects. And for example, different descriptors, image or shape descriptors would fit there. So basically, Working with uh, three-dimensional shapes, uh, the, the, the field of geometry processing or geometry analysis, somehow, uh, I wouldn't say legs behind, but it has a completely different set of methods that have been developed and they're pretty disconnected from the methods used in the domain of uh, 1D or 2D signal processing. And uh, if you know, in these fields, there has been in the last years quite some impressive revolution, all the compressed sensing methods and uh, sparse coding methods that that were invented in more or less the last decade or the last 15 years, uh, have not penetrated into the domain of uh, 3D uh, geometry analysis. And uh, basically, if we look at how these different domains look like, more or less there is a brick wall between the, the 2D and the 3D worlds. 
and today I, I hope I will try to convince you that if, uh, if we are not able to breach this wall, but at least to make a small hole and try to, uh, to bring some, some of these methods from signal processing to the 3D world. And in particular, I will mention uh, sparse coding methods. I will uh, talk also about matrix completion methods and some maybe slightly more niche or exotic uh, um, class of algorithms that is called joint diagonalization. So I will show how these methods can be applied to the domain of 3D shape analysis. I guess one of the main reasons why there is such a disconnect and such a wall is one of the main reasons is the lack of shift invariance that exists with uh, uh, one or two dimensional signals, basically the signals that live in Euclidean spaces and there is no shift invariance on, on manifolds. So as a prototype exa example or a prototype application, I will consider the problem of shape correspondence. So this is a very easy setting, or easy, in, I would say, in some cases it might be easy. Uh, let's say prototypical application of shape correspondence, you have two different poses of a shape and you want to find correspondence between either sparse or better dense set of points on these shapes. So you can see an example of correspondence between two different poses of the horse. So usually this is a restrictive assumption. You assume that uh, the shapes are nearly isometric. So there is some almost inelastic deformation that, that, uh, that uh, uh, basically one, sh one pose is uh, inelastic deformation of some reference shape. But of course, more interesting examples include, for example, missing information. This is what you will get, for example, from a 3D scan or maybe different shape representation. So in computer vision, I think it is more common to work with point cloud rather than triangular meshes, but you might have a high quality CAD model of your, of your object. And uh, non-isometric shapes, for example, you want to match an elephant to a horse, the, the geometric structure is quite different. So basically going from the easier problem to the harder problem, I hope that I will convince you that at least in some cases we can address these problems through a, a common framework. So just a very brief introduction. We'll be uh, using some notions in harmonic analysis. And basically the main idea of harmonic analysis, if you have a function, let's say a real function on the interval between minus and plus pi, uh, you can uh, represent it as a linear combination of some uh, harmonic functions. So that's the idea of Fourier series. And basically you can write uh, the Fourier transform, the forward Fourier transform by just taking this mm -hmm function, uh, your function f and projecting it on these uh, orthogonal basis functions. So you get Fourier coefficients or the forward Fourier transform. And if you want to compose the signal back, you just multiply these coefficients by the basis functions and you sum them up, okay? So this is, I guess, basic course in harmonic analysis. Probably what they don't teach in courses on harmonic analysis that these basis function functions actually arise uh, from eigenfunctions of a Laplacian operator. So if you take the second order derivative of the, these complex exponentials, you will get uh, immediately the, the eigen, uh, this eigenfunction relation. So by analogy, we can apply the same thing to manifolds. And in this case, uh, the Laplacian is replaced by what is called the Laplace Beltrami operator. So it's the non-Euclidean analogy of the Laplacian. It operates on the tangent space on, uh, on the manifold. So we also get uh, an, a set of orthonormal basis functions. The corresponding eigenvalues uh, play the role of frequency. So Basically, eigenfunctions corresponding to larger eigenvalues will have more oscillations. And the inner products here are understood as inner products on the space of functions that, that live on the manifold. Other than that, it's exactly the same thing. So basically, you have orthogonal basis. You can uh, analyze and syn synthesize functions in this orthogonal basis. So of course, in the discrete setting, we work with discrete shapes. So we can discretize the Laplacian. The most straightforward thing of doing it is considering a point cloud and some nearest neighbor connectivity. So you take a vertex, you connect it to its nearest neighbors, and you construct, for example, Gaussian weights on the graph that you obtain in this way. More sophisticated uh, structure, what is called a cotangent weight uh, or cotangent Laplacian. If you also have, in addition, the triangular mesh, so you have triangles, and you can take into account the geometric structure of the triangles by considering the, the basically the cotangent of these angles. I don't want to go into details, but basically it's related to the discretization of the mean curvature on, on the manifold. And basically you can consider functions on the manifold as n-dimensional vectors, where n is the number of vertices, and the Laplacian will be just an n by n matrix that acts on these, uh, on these vectors. So basically everything can be written as uh, products of matrices and vectors. So to the problem of uh, 
shape correspondence. Basically, the traditional way of thinking of shape correspondence is a correspondence between points on shapes. So if you have this cat, I want to find a map a point xi to some other uh, corresponding point yj on the dog. And we can impose some, some constraints or some criteria on this map. So for example, we would like this map to preserve uh, some intrinsic structures like geodesic distances and find the map with minimum distortion. So today actually I would like to depart from this model and uh, instead I would like to consider uh, maps between functions on the manifolds. So this is a nice model of functional correspondence that was introduced by Max Ovsianikov and his colleagues. And basically it, uh, it models the correspondence as a linear operator that takes a function from space of functions on X, so functions that live on a cat, and maps them to uh, functions that live on the dog. You can see it here, and of course, you can immediately see that this is generalization of the previous model, uh, which would be a particular case when you map delta functions into delta functions. <coughs> okay, so what is nice about this model that uh, given that uh, you have a function f on a cat and let's say corresponding function g on a dog, each of them can be represented using the respective Fourier basis. So let's denote it by phi and psi. So basically, you can think of uh, uh, the, the functional correspondence as correspondence between the Fourier coefficients. So basically, you need to translate coefficients from basis phi to basis psi. And basically, this uh, gives rise to this linear system of equations. So basically, there is a linear relation between corresponding function on, uh, on the cat and on the dog that is encoded by this matrix C. Basically, that tells how the uh, coefficients are translated from one basis to another. And uh, basically, these matrices phi uh, sub index k and psi sub index k, I will use them to denote the truncated Fourier basis with k first vectors. So you can think of it as a kind of low pass filter. And n and m will be the number of vertices in the corresponding shapes. Okay, so this is how this matrix will look like. It has almost diagonal structure. And we know that for shapes that are ideally isometric, this matrix will be ideally diagonal. And not only ideally diagonal, but also plus or minus one on the diagonal. But of course, this is not usually the case. And in this case, the transformation is not exactly isometric. So it somehow departs from the diagonal structure. But still, you can clearly see that, that it has this nice structure. Now, what is important to say about uh, this framework that in order to find these metrics, you need to find the corresponding functions f and g independently on your two shapes. And basically, for this purpose, we'll need to resort to shape descriptors. I don't have time to go in depth into different shape descriptors. You can, you can see that there is basically a lot of literature on this. And many of the descriptors uh, on, that are used for 3D shapes actually try to mimic what has been successfully applied to image analysis, like there is intrinsic sift descriptors or intrinsic shape context. Uh, I would like to say a few words about our algorithm uh, that basically that extends uh, maximally stable extremal regions to shapes. And the idea there is to construct a hierarchy. So you start with each vertex being a separate cluster, and then you, uh, uh, you aggregate these clusters using some parameter t. So you can think of it as a kind of diffusion process. And basically, you join clusters when the distance between them is smaller than some threshold t. As you increase t at the end, you will get a tree-like structure with the root being the entire shape. And now, if you see how the area of these, uh, of these clusters change uh, as a function of this parameter t, you'll see that for some clusters, it will change less. For some, it will change more. So we can define the stability criterion as the ratio of the area over the derivative of the area. And basically, the local extrema of this criterion will be the stable component. So it's exactly like the MSCR works for images. Mm -hmm. It's just done intrinsically on the shapes. So basically, with this algorithm, we can detect these blobs in our shapes. So if we assume for the time being that the shapes are approximately isometric, this is our input information. So we get these, uh, we get these blobs that are detected. And what I assume for the time being that their order is given. So by order, I mean that I know that this uh, green one corresponds to this green one. Okay? So let's denote these blobs by f and g. So these are functions, in this case, binary functions. Uh, defined on the respective manifolds. And I assume that they are roughly correspondent. So gi approximately equals to t fi, where I remind you t is unknown. This is the correspondence I'm trying to find. 
Okay, and uh, basically the matrix C in our functional representation, in the frequency representation, is found just by solving this system of QK equations with K squared variables. Okay, where F and G are matrices containing as columns the corresponding functions. Okay, and allow me to denote by A and B the projections of these matrices on the corresponding eigenbasis. So basically these are the Fourier coefficients and we have a linear set of equations that uh, allow to recover the the, the frequency representation of the correspondence. Okay? Now to a more interesting setting. Uh, now we assume that we don't know the order of these, of these blobs. So now I, I don't know whether this blob corresponds to this blob or this blob or any other of these blobs. So again, we assume that the number of blobs is the same, Q, but now there is some unknown permutation matrix that relates these blobs, that orders them. Okay? So this is a Q by Q permutation matrix, and our system of equations looks like this. And this is already, this has become much nastier. We have too many degrees of freedom, right? We need to solve this problem with respect to matrix C and the permutation matrix pi. But now remember that we assume that the shapes are approximately isometric, so we know that the matrix C must be diagonal or approximately diagonal. So we can introduce this as a penalty, and we solve a problem that looks like sparse coding problem. So we have a combination of, uh, of L2 and L1 norms. So this is actually our penalty that forces diagonal structure on C. So Z is a fixed matrix of weights that has zero diagonal and non-zero of diagonal elements. And this is our data term. So if we look at this problem and we fix the permutation pi, assume that we know it, basically it becomes the sparse coding problem or what is called in statistics the lasso problem. Classical problem in signal processing there are very efficient solvers for solving this problem. Okay? Now, if we assume that C is given, let's see what we get. So if we get rid of the constant terms with respect to pi, our permutation, and if we write explicitly this, this norm. So the first term, it looks like quadratic, but actually it's constant because pi transpose pi, pi being a permutation, it's orthogonal matrix, so it goes away. Get rid also of the constant term, and we get something that looks like a linear assignment problem. Okay, and there is also standard ways of solving linear assignment problems. And usually we relax pi to be double stochastic matrix. So it has sum of columns and rows equal to one and non-negative elements. And again, this is a classical problem that has very efficient and very simple solutions. And we alternate these stages. Uh, we can actually prove that the, uh, this uh, alternating minimization converges. Unfortunately, we cannot prove yet at least that it converges globally, but in practice, we see that it converges quite nicely. At least we have not seen any local minima uh, in our experience. Okay, so of course, the more generic case, nobody promises that we always detect the same blobs. So in general, the number of blobs will be different and we might get some regions that we detect here that are not present on the other shape and the other way around. So the way to model it is to assume that the matrix pi is now not square anymore, so it's not permutation in strict sense, it will have some columns that may vanish. And also some rows of this system of equations may not hold. So basically to model this, we introduce an outlier term. So basically outlier goes into the data term and it, it takes care of the wrong rows of this system of equations. And we want this outlier to be row-wise sparse. And basically the penalty that induces row-wise sparsity is what is called the L21 norm. That is sum of uh, L2 norms of the of the rows of the matrix. Okay, so exactly the same way of solving it. The first problem, if we fix pi, it's the robust sparse coding problem. Again, there are efficient ways of solving it, for example, using splitting algorithms. And if we fix the correspondence and the outlier terms, the, uh, uh, basically the, the problem with respect to pi, the only modification from the previous case we need to do is to allow it to have uh, vanishing columns. And this is done by relaxing one of these constraints, basically it becomes now a substochastic matrix. And you can see why we cannot allow both columns and rows to vanish because in this case we would get a trivial solution, pi equal to zero. So let me show you an example how this works. And this is a little bit artificial example in the sense that in most cases we've seen converges in one or two iterations. And actually this is a more interesting example when it takes three iterations to converge. Uh, I, I refer to outer iterations of this alternating minimization. So these are real shapes. So one of them is synthetic, one of them is scanned. And we run our shape MSR algorithm. In, on the first shape, we detect nine blobs. On the second one, we detect 12. 
And the ordering between them initially is assumed to be arbitrary. So we initialize pi with identity matrix. You can see that it's 9 by 12, so it's not square. And you can see that the ordering is arbitrary. For example, this arm is uh, ordered together with, uh, with this chest. Okay? And the correspondence here, colors, similar colors, represent corresponding points. So the correspondence is also quite arbitrary. And the outlier term is very large. So one iteration. You can see that the matrix pi, we almost sorted out the ordering of the components. The only two components that are incorrect are the yellow and the blue. You can see that here they are swapped. You see that the correspondence has improved dramatically. And the outlier matrix contains only two strong rows. And these rows exactly correspond to these two regions. One additional iteration. Now the ordering of the regions is correct. And the correspondence is very nice. And the outlier matrix is very small. As you say, it looks like it's... So left and right, this is, uh, this is an excellent question. Actually, be, being intrinsic, we cannot distinguish between symmetries. So left and right can be flipped if you don't add any information, for example, about orientation of the surface. Yeah, but basically all intrinsic correspondence methods are defined up to intrinsic symmetry. So that's, that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> uh, another example, so in this case, we have, uh, instead of the blobs, we have points. So imagine that you run some uh, feature detector with maybe some, uh, uh, that, that produces the set of points. And basically the permutation uh, part gives you a correspondence between, the, between these feature points and the, the C part, the, the matrix actually interpolates the correspondence between them. And you can see that this is a nice uh, combination of combinatorial and continuous problem that uh, gives you at the end the dense correspondence between the shapes. So in this case, you can see that some of the points that were deemed to be non-corresponding, so they are discarded. You can see that they appear in the outlier matrix. So here are some examples of uh, correspondences between different poses of shapes. So the correspondences look quite nice. And uh, these are scanned models of uh, human shape from the SCAPE database. And some numerical examples. So this is the Princeton benchmark, basically, which tells you it's kind of cumulative characteristic. It tells you uh, the percentage of correspondences that fall within certain geodesic radius uh, with respect to the ground truth correspondence. So basically, the higher the curve, the better. And here we plot some of the state-of-the-art methods for shape correspondence. And you can see that we achieve easily much better results with using just 20 uh, basis functions and only the indicator function as uh, our, uh, as our uh, data. So basically we use uh, blobs essentially that we find, uh, we find using our MSR algorithm. And if we use bigger K and more sophisticated descriptors, wave kernel signatures, we get significant boost in performance. So now it outperforms all the methods by tens of percents. Now it would be a nice end of story, but let me show you some failure cases, and expectedly, uh, the method fails in case when you have non-isometric uh, shapes. So if we can still find a reasonably uh, high quality map between a human and the monkey, for example, uh, Simpson is completely inhuman, and the cat or the alien, the, the, the map is completely garbage. And of course, it's not surprising because we assume that the shapes are isometric. So for isometric shapes, the correspondence matrix represented in the Laplacian eigenbasis was approximately diagonal. If the shapes are non-isometric, there is no reason whatsoever to expect this diagonal structure. And if we impose it by using our L1 prior, then of course we, we, get, we get garbage. So in order to understand actually where this uh, non-diagonal structure comes from, we need to look deeper into basically how uh, Laplacian eigenfunctions behave on different manifolds. And of course we know that for isometric manifolds where we have simple spectrum, so basically, there is no multiplicity of eigenvalues. Uh, the ambiguity is only a sign. So if phi is an eigenfunction, then minus phi is also an eigenfunction. If there is multi multiplicity, basically, there are subspaces of the eigenspace where we can apply any rotation, and we still get a valid eigenbasis. So uh, in general, this is the ambiguity we get. And if the manifolds are non-isometric, then the eigenvectors can differ dramatically in their structure, and usually this difference will increase with frequency. So if we go to higher eigenfunctions, we can get completely different things. And you can actually see it in this example of a cat and the tiger. So if the first eigenfunction differs approximately up to a sign, then for example, the fourth eigenfunction of the tiger would correspond to the sixth eigenfunction of the cat. Okay? So 
one way of dealing with it, and here we come to the second signal processing algorithm that I mentioned in the beginning, would be by means of uh, jointly diagonalizing the allocation operators. So the idea of joint diagonalization is to try to find a common set of eigenvectors that would diagonalize two matrices. And it was uh, used mainly in the domain of uh, blind source separation, where it was applied to covariance matrices that represented the, the observed sources of uh, uh, source signals uh, or their mixtures. Mm -hmm. And here we try to apply to Laplacians. So basically the idea is to construct uh, uh, orthogonal bases as a sequence of rotations. And these rotations would serve as approximate uh, eigenvectors because in most cases you cannot diagonalize two matrices unless they commute. So it will be an approximation of an eigenbasis. Of course, the problem with this approach that we assume not only that the matrices are of the same size, but also that we know the ordering of their columns and rows. And in some applications, like in machine learning, it might be a good model. In our case, when we are looking for correspondence, we need to know the correspondence to do joint diagonalization. Of course, sounds meaningless. So this model is, of course, not applicable to this application of shape uh, correspondence. So instead of we can think of a coupled uh, uh, approximate diagonalization. Instead of finding a common eigenbasis, we are looking for two bases. So here the phi hat and psi hat, the first k eigenvectors. And we want them to approximately diagonalize the respective Laplacians, but also to be coupled in the following sense. If we have a set of functions, let's say function f and g, we know that they correspond. So we expand them in the basis phi hat and psi hat, we get some Fourier coefficients, a hat and b hat. So we want these coefficients to be as similar to each other as possible. So this is exactly the coupling term that you can see here. Okay, so we're looking for a pair of bases that would uh, be approximate eigenbases and they will be coupled. Okay, now from perturbation analysis of joint diagonalizers, we can, we can see that if two matrices are close to each other, so one matrix is a perturbation of another matrix and some technical details, like they have delta separated spectrum, then the ith joint approximate eigenvector can be written as the ith uh, eigenvector of the first matrix plus some perturbation term. Basically what it tells us essentially that the subspace that is spanned by the first k joint approximate eigenvector is approximately equal to the subspace spanned by the first eigenvectors of the matrix. Or in other words, we can represent the joint eigenvectors as linear combinations of the eigenvectors of the respective Laplacians. So by denote by S and R, the linear combination coefficients. Okay, so we sum up K prime eigenvectors and we get K joint approximate eigenvectors. Okay, if I plug in this representation in our coupled diagonalization problem, a lot of things cancel out. So for example, phi transpose L phi, it's the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues of the first Laplacian, same way for the second Laplacian, and phi transpose phi because it's an orthonormal basis equals to identity. So we are left with this problem. And in this problem, you can note that the Laplacian doesn't appear explicitly. And also the problem size, this is probably one of the most important features, is independent on the number of samples. So basically our variables are the matrices R and S, which are orthonormal, you can see it here. Basically the constraint that we got after things canceled out tells us that these are rotation matrices. And uh, basically it means that we can work with meshes of practically any size. If you give me the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues, I can easily solve this optimization with respect to k by k matrices, which are usually small, something like 50 by 50 or 100 by 100. So this is one of the nice, nice features of this approach. And geometrically you can think of it as trying to rotate our basis, the phi and psi, in such a way that this is approximately an eigenbasis, so we minimize this off-diagonality term. This is sum of squared off-diagonal elements of the matrix. And at the same time, we want the corresponding Fourier coefficients to be similar, so we want coupling. Okay, so let me show you how these uh, di off-diagonal terms look like. So for isometric shapes, uh, the matrix is almost ideally diagonal. With this projector, you cannot even see off-diagonal elements. With non-isometric shapes, of course, there are some off-diagonal elements, but they are small. And overall, this is a diagonally dominated matrix. And this is an example of how the, uh, the coupled bases look like. So we have uh, two different meshes, near isometric deformations. And here we also subsample the mesh 10 times. So we get to less than 1,000 vertices. And you can see that the functions look actually very similar to each other. 
A more challenging example here, we actually used different shape representations. In the first case, it's a triangular mesh. In the second case, it's a point cloud. And we use a different Laplacian. Here we use the cotangent Laplacian. Here we use the graph Laplacian of, on the point cloud. And still, even being completely different geometric structures, they're almost jointly diagonalizable. And we get these nice coupled approximate eigenfunctions. OK, so going back to our correspondence problem, if this was the structure of the matrix C expressed, expressed in the Laplacian eigenbasis, it looked almost diagonal for near isometric shapes and completely random for non-isometric shapes. If we now express it with respect to the coupled basis, we get these structures. So you can see that it is perfectly diagonal in the first case, and if not perfectly, but at least diagonally dominant in the second case. OK, so now we can apply it to the problem of non-isometric shape matching. And if we have, for example, a monkey and a human, and again, we run the shape MSR algorithm to detect blobs. And you can see, actually, that the blobs are not exactly corresponding. So we get quite some noisy, uh, noisy results. So there is, of course, no, we don't expect the, the, uh, the, uh, the region detection to work exactly in the same way on these two geometrically different shapes. Uh, so basically, we find C by solving a system of QK equations with K squared variables. But if we assume that C is diagonal, we can actually ignore all the off-diagonal elements. And we can rewrite this system of equations only for the diagonal elements of the matrix. And basically, it looks like this. Now we, we are left with K, Q equations with only K variables. So actually, we have much less degrees of freedom. And basically, this is a good reduction of degrees of freedom because the bases are constructed in such a way that uh, we have this diagonal structure. And this is an example of correspondence. So very bad correspondence in the first case if we solve the original d squares problem and much better correspondence if we assume that the matrix is diagonal. Okay, so let me recap. And uh, we started with functional correspondence. It was represented in uh, truncated Laplacian eigenbasis using k first eigenvectors. So it's a kind of a low pass filter. And on the one hand, for accurate correspondence, we want k to be as large as possible, right? So you want your correspondence to be accurate. So basically, by truncating the basis, you're applying low pass filter. You want basically this filter to be as high pass as possible, right? So we move as few, uh, uh, the, the least amount of information as possible. On the other hand, we have only q corresponding uh, functions. And you want k to be smaller than q. Otherwise, your system will be over you will be underdetermined. You will have more degrees of freedom than data. And then, of course, you, basically you will be guessing the correspondence. So basically, these are two conflicting things. And the main difficulty that this Q in typical situations is small. It is difficult, especially in non-isometric cases, to detect meaningful corresponding functions on the, on the manifolds. We've seen also that diagonal structure can be taken advantage of in case of uh, isometric shapes. Right? So this was a prior that made the permuted sparse coding work well. Mm -hmm. And we've seen also that if we design a specially tailored uh, coupled basis, then uh, expressing the, the, the matrix C in these bases works better. So the question is actually, do we need the basis at all? If we want to revisit this problem, we can actually work directly with the correspondence operator. So to remind you, the correspondence operator, it's a linear operator between spaces of functions on the two shapes, on the manifolds x and y. right? So in the discrete setting, it's a matrix of size n by m, where n and m are the number of vertices on the two shapes. Usually, these are big numbers. So it's between thousands and maybe hundred thousands of vertices. So this will be a big matrix. And we want to address this problem as a matrix completion problem. Okay, So I guess everybody here is familiar with matrix completion problems. Usually, you are given a few samples of a matrix. And uh, you want, basically, this, uh, this is used as a data term. And you want to find the low rank matrix that explains these data. So in our case, instead of giving samples, we are given projections of the matrix. So basically, the data term is exactly the same as we've seen before. We also use a low rank model. So if you remember, in the previous case, the rank was fixed. We truncated the basis to, be, uh, to, to contain only k elements. So these are the matrix T is of rank k at most. Now here we are using the nuclear norm, which is the sum of the singular values of the matrix, basically to, uh, to detect automatically the effective rank. And here there are some other terms that I will explain in a second. So basically this is why we call it the geometric matrix completion. So what is the meaning of these trace terms? Let's look at them first. So basically these trace terms are what is called in physics the Dirichlet energy. And this is the smoothness term. So 
basically the columns of the matrix T are the mappings of a delta function on X to Y, right? So if I take a delta function on X, uh, uh, the column of the matrix T, the ith column of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the matrix T will be the function that corresponds to this delta, right? So if I have two nearby points, Xi and Xi prime on the first shape, then the corresponding I and I primes columns should be similar, right? So this, uh, this is meant by smoothness, okay? And the same way in the other direction for mapping from Y to X, the, the, the rows of the matrix that correspond to nearby points should be similar, right? So this is exactly what is taken care of by these uh, trace terms. Okay, what is the meaning of the L1 term here? So we demand sparsity of the matrix T. It means that a delta will correspond to a function that has a few non-zero coefficients, okay? So by itself, it would be meaningless, but we also have the smoothness. So you have sparsity and you have smoothness, and both things will, tell you, will, will give you localization. So basically, we'll have a few coefficients that are non-zero, and then we'll be somehow spatially close to each other. Okay, so this is an idea that comes from a paper of uh, Stanley Osher from UCLA and his group, and basically they call it compressed uh, eigenmodes. So we have, they apply it to basis functions, we apply it directly to the correspondence operator. And basically, this is our geometric matrix completion problem. We have the data term, we have the low rank, basically the, the term that uh, tells us that we have a small number of degrees of freedom, smoothness, and localization, okay? Now, if we parameterize T as uh, a product of two matrices, U by V transpose, and I pay attention here that this is not a singular value decomposition, U and V are not necessarily orthonormal, Basically, this is a factorization of a matrix, and if u and v are of size m by k and n by k, k is arbitrary number, so we can basically take it even infinite. It, uh, basically, it's a, it's a parameterization of a matrix of rank k at most. Okay, and then you can rewrite the nuclear norm in this way, a sum of squared Frobenius norms of these factors. So this is an equivalent formulation of the previous problem, where now the optimization variables are u and v, the left and the right factors. And again, the terms are give us smoothness and localization. K can be arbitrarily large. So basically it is dictated not by the amount of data, but by the computational considerations. And now we don't have any basis with respect to which we represent our uh, correspondence. So actually if you consider the factors u and v as some ad hoc basis, then the correspondence is always represented by identity metrics. So if in the previous approaches, we tried to make this matrix as diagonal as possible. Now it is guaranteed to be not only diagonal, but also identity. And actually it is interesting to look at these bases. So these are the first uh, columns of the matrices U and V. And you can see that they are coupled and they are also meaningful. They look ki like kind of harmonic bases. They look like similarly to eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Okay, of course here we can also use the subspace parameterization trick. So if we parameterize U and V as linear combinations of the eigenvectors of the corresponding Laplacians. Again, things cancel out in this problem, and we get, again, a problem where the number of variables is independent on the number of samples of the shapes. So again, we have a fixed size problem, and it can work with shapes with uh, basically an arbitrary number of samples. Okay, and what is important here, a big difference from the previous approach is, again, that uh, k can be arbitrarily large. So k is a bound on our rank, on the number of degrees of freedom of the model. So to illustrate how it works, let's consider the uh, previous least square solution, right? Where we have q, the number of functions in the data term to be equal to 50, right? So these are 50 blobs that I give you, that I know that they, they correspond. And we change k, which is the complexity of the model. Right, so the rank of the, of the correspondence operator. So you can see that if k is below 50, then we are improving, look at the blue curves. But when it goes above 50, we are actually getting worse correspondence. And this is basically, this is a classical situation when we have an underdetermined uh, system of equations. Okay, but look now at this solution that is based on matrix completion. So you see that the correspondence quality, basically the curves be become higher as we increase the complexity of the model. And this is also a classical behavior of a good regularization. So basically it means that our regularization is meaningful. We are adding degrees of freedom. The, basically the amount of data is smaller than the number of degrees of freedom. So basically the, the role of the regularization here is important. And you can see that it's meaningful. That 
it works better for increasing the, uh, increasing the, the rank, the number of degrees of freedom. And uh, basically now it's limited only by computational efficiency. So you can, in principle, you can increase it however you want. It will just cost you more to do the optimization. Here is a different view of the same experiment. So here we show a map from this point to another shape. And you can see that as k increases, the map becomes a lot more localized, but you can also get some oscillations. So what is called in harmonic analysis, the Gibbs, uh, the Gibbs uh, phenomenon. And you can see that with matrix completion, because we have the localization term, there are no these oscillations. So the localization is much cleaner than in the least square solution. So again, the Princeton correspondence benchmark, some uh, quantitative examples. So you can see here actually that this method works much better in case when we have uh, scarce information. So if you have just a few blobs, then the least square solution performs very poorly and our method performs very nicely. So basically, the regularization plays a more important role in these, in these situations. Again, some examples. So correspondence between scape shapes, near isometric. Of course, this, that's an easy case. It works nicely. These are uh, noisy shapes. So we take a monkey and add some geometric and topological noise. And even in some extreme cases, when we remove big parts of the shapes, the correspondence is still meaningful even though not as clean as in the, in the previous cases, but still meaningful, non-isometric shapes. So I would say that it's reasonable correspondence. Maybe the horse takes it to the limit. This is already not a nice correspondence, but at least the, 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 legs, the legs are approximately correct. But that would be a very hard problem anyway. So I would consider it as a failure case. But for example, Simpson and Baby and Alien still work nicely. Correspondence between meshes and point clouds also works nicely. And basically in the time that I think something like five minutes that I still have left, let me remind you of this landscape that we considered. So we had two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and n-dimensional world. So basically I talked about manifold correspondence and exemplified it with three-dimensional shapes, but actually you can think of manifold correspondence in n dimensions. And many problems in computer vision pattern recognition involves geometric data that is n-dimensional. So you can think of some feature spaces where your data can be thought of uh, as a manifold or a graph. So I would like to show you a few examples from this domain. So this is a classical example from the paper of Andrew Eng on spectral clustering. And basically these are four concentric circles that if you try to cluster them with k means you will get garbage. And uh, basically, the main idea of spectral clustering is to construct a Laplacian and use its first eigenfunctions to map the data into the eigenspace of the Laplacian. And in this space, you can do easy clustering because basically you will get uh, points that are connected by, by uh, in your graph clustered together. But if we make a small but nasty modification of these data set, we take the circles and uh, perturb them a little bit. So. For example, these internal and external circles will be slightly touching. Then uh, spectral clustering will fail completely because of this adjacency, because of this topological noise. It will seem that these points should belong to the same cluster. And another different example where different circles are touching, mm -hmm. you'll see that it also fails. So the idea is basically the main problem of multimodal clustering is how to take advantage of these two different views or different modalities of the same data where you have slightly different noise and produce a result like this. So this is a result of joint diagonalization. So we take these two Laplacians and we jointly diagonalize them. And basically, the, uh, the approximate joint eigenfunctions are used as a space where we do the k-means clustering. And this is what we get. So in this example, there is only one outlier. And that's probably very hard to see here. I don't see it either. Here's a more interesting example. This was, of course, a very synthetic toy data set. But here is an example of uh, images from Flickr, so they have some simple uh, visual descriptors, in this case, 64-dimensional color histograms, and also annotations that are represented as 1,000-dimensional uh, histograms of most frequently used tags. And basically, we consider these two different uh, modalities as different spaces. We construct their, their respective graphs with uh, Gaussian weights. So basically, we have two different Laplacians, and we try to uh, cluster these data sets first using each modality separately, and then using the two modalities jointly. So this is the clustering that you get with uh, uh, using only the tag information. 
And I'm showing you here the content of one cluster where the colors represent the ground truth clustering. And you can see that it mixes together a lot of completely unrelated images. So for example, swimming tigers and natural scenes will be clustered together. And the reason for this ambiguity is that uh, being a tag based segmentation, uh, basically the confusion is between uh, tags like underwater tiger and water waterfall or basically related uh, tags that have nothing to do with the visual structure of the image. This is what we get if you use only the color histograms. And in this case, the confusion comes from the similar colors. So yellowish tigers are similar somehow to fall scenes of nature. And this is what happens when we use uh, the joint clustering, the joint diagonalization. And here I'm on purpose showing a cluster where there is only one outlier, that's this tiger, but all the rest are correct. So some numerical data, some standard uh, multi-view clustering data sets, some state-of-the-art methods that, that are out there. And you can see that we outperform all the other methods and also big difference that we don't need one-to-one -one correspondence. This is usually the assumption that is assumed in multi-view clustering that you have one-to-one -one correspondence between data sets. Here in some cases, having just 10% of correspondence, we can achieve better performance than any other methods. So I guess that's all. I would like, of course, to, to thank all my collaborators, especially my graduate students, and of course, the European Research Council for generous funding of these projects, and of course, to you for your attention. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, we have some time for questions, so uh, anyone? Michael, it looks amazing, but how easy is it to apply to real data sets, for, say from Connect? If I was to give you three-dimensional data from a Connect sensor or, you know, maybe Connect Fusion, how applicable are these methods? I have the impression it's still, it's still a, a gap. So, well, I, I agree that there is a gap. I think uh, in, in case of Kinect, uh, the main problem will be a lot of missing uh, information. So like, for example, if you scan uh, my body, you probably all the back will be missing. So in this case, uh, probably the Laplacian eigenvalue functions will not be a good, uh, a good choice of basis because they are global. So you will need to resort to something local. And there are constructions like wavelets on manifolds or localized basis. So that would be probably a better, better choice. Well, and the rest, of course, uh, whether you're able to find a good descriptor that, uh, that will work with such data. And again, there are such descriptors. So what I will show tomorrow actually are convolutional neural networks that can be applied on, on manifolds. And uh, at least uh, our claim is that uh, this is the kind of descriptors that you would use in this situation. But I guess that we have not really tested it with uh, such challenging data. So it, it was more uh, the, 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 the kind of CAD models. So I, I, there, there is probably a little bit of a gap. The main assumption is a smooth surface is going to be completely closed. There must be... Not necessarily. Closed. Actually, we have seen some examples with boundaries and holes and noise. So it doesn't need to be smooth. You can construct populations uh, on practically anything. Uh, yeah, so the question is well, how uh, well will the correspondence look like? So I've got a question too. Um, when you described the joint basis correspondence solution, you took explicit account of missing data. No. Is that wrong? No, we, we don't take into account the missing data. We don't. I thought that was the O matrix. Oh, you mean the O matrix. So the O matrix, it was the, the first approach was the, uh, the, the permuted sparse coding. The basis there was fixed. So the O matrix actually takes into account the missing uh, or unknown ordering of the, uh, uh, of the corresponding functions. So if you, you don't know uh, which function corresponds to, to, to which function, if I use an analogy from image matching, imagine that you run your uh, feature detector and you don't have a feature descriptor. So you get a bunch of regions or points and you don't have any descriptor. So just from this information, I, uh, I give you a dense correspondence between, well, in this case, shapes, or in the two-dimensional examples will be images. So this is pretty impressive, but the power is in, uh, in of course, in the uh, assumption of isometry, something that you don't have for images. So in computer vision, this would sound probably like black magic if just from a set of points you would be able to get a dense correspondence. So would that answer the other parts of my question is redundant, because it was, <laughs> it was broken. 
Um, I'm just wondering like, how fast this is and can it be like real time? So the first two methods, extremely fast. Uh, the second method with matrix completion, it depends on the choice of K. But So the first are probably a few seconds in MATLAB, can be real time. The second one probably tens of seconds, the, the, the matrix completion based. So I would say, it's, if not real time, but close to being real time. And it can be tuned. Of course. So I just had a quick question. Is it always instance to instance? I mean, so is it always specific to the two meshes that are being compared? Or are there artifacts of the process that can be shared and computation saved um, if you're dealing with different instances of the same things? Like, for example, different hands or, or different tigers? Excellent question. So basically, you can easily extend what I showed here to collections of shapes. Just for simplicity, I showed pairs of shapes, but you can analyze more. And actually, when you have a collection of shapes, uh, uh, it helps because you can also introduce uh, things like transitive closure. So basically you want the correspondence if you go from shape X to shape Y, from Y to Z, and then back you want this correspondence to be consistent. So basically you add more constraints. Of course, the assumption is that these shapes are somehow similar geometrically. But if you have, for example, a collection of four-legged creatures and you're able to detect components in a consistent way, you will end up uh, with basically a bigger problem with more variables, but it will actually help you to have more shapes than just a pair of shapes. And have you done any of those experiments to see what sorts of basis functions arise? So, yes, we did it in, in our paper, in Eurographics paper, that uh, uh, on couple diagonalization we show examples with four shapes. Yeah. But we didn't explore it extensively. Um, oh, Is okay? Yeah. So deal with, to deal with the, the issues with like uh, dirty connect data that's missing big parts, could you then um, perhaps pursue this idea that we were just talking about having collections of shapes? So, for example, you could like deform a body into many different shapes, and then you know the exact correspondences, and you could even delete like parts of the mesh, um, and then somehow you would be able to match this to your so depth I, data. I think I think uh, if you want to deal explicitly with uh, partially overlapping or partially correspondence, so non-bijective correspondences, essentially then probably the model where you work explicitly with uh, the correspondence operator and not with its functional representation, or not with its frequency representation would be better. And then maybe you can introduce explicitly the mask, you know, basically what are the missing parts. And they will be unknown and you basically it will be one of the optimization variables. So a kind of robust PCA kind of approach where instead of, for example, sparsity term, you will get a low rank term and uh, some, for example, piecewise constant term. The, the outliers or the missing parts. So we have not tried it, but it sounds like an interesting direction. Um, so, so you showed increasingly impressive results on that Princeton benchmark. Do you have a, an idea of what's left to close the gap to you know, zero error, error and, or indeed so how, how accurate it is? Let me just show, uh, uh, maybe I didn't, didn't say how to interpret these data, but basically what is shown here, it's the percentage of uh, uh, error, basically it's a fraction of geodesic diameter of the shape. So just to give you a, an intuition, 5% of geodesic diameter is approximately this size. So basically it's at least size of the palm. So there is pretty much to, to go still. Basically the correspondence, for example, in this kind of correspondence will probably not distinguish between different fingers. It will not be that accurate enough. So just, what, what, oh, yeah, just, just I mean, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with this data set. Like what is the task? So is here you're finding correspondence. Between different, different shapes? Arbitrary shapes. Well, let's say human shapes, but okay. also animals and so shapes of, uh, of different creatures. Uh, there is ground truth correspondence, dense ground truth correspondence, and you're comparing to these ground truth correspondence. Basically, the, your error criterion is the distance between ground truth correspondence and your correspondence uh, in terms of geodesic distance okay. on the manifold. Yeah, so 5% is quite a lot. Pairwise? With no For all points. For all the points, yes. Okay, well, we better wrap up. So uh, let's, uh, we'll thank Michael again.